The place to be is living free, living free in Tennessee. That's actually really interesting. It hasn't happened to me in a long time where like the sound got sent to my television, but it totally got sent to my television. Now I've uninstalled the app that does that, but there we go. So we're going to start the whole podcast over again. You guys cool with that? Yeah. I actually meant to check the sound settings before I started. Um, but yeah, the, the TV is in the other room. And it was like, hey, we're going to record Nicole from her TV in the other room. And it turns out you couldn't hear Nicole at all. So let's do this again. Woohoo! One second. We're going to do the music again, too, okay? Does that sound like a plan? All right. The place to be is living free. Living well, I hit free play and nothing happened. Let's try that again. Okay, no music today. We are going to have technical difficulties. Ready? Five seconds. Welcome to Living Free in Tennessee, where we talk about building the life you choose on your terms. Today is Monday, February 12th, 2024, and this is episode 862 of Living Free in Tennessee. And it is a Monday, so we have our usual segments today. And you may have noticed that earlier in the year, like we've been kind of doing motivational, build your life better sorts of focus topics for our Monday shows all year. Well, today that's changing for a bit because spring is coming. And what that means on the homestead is it's time to get cracking. Mona's telling me in the comments that it did do the music. So that's interesting. Uh, I couldn't hear it at all, but I'm sure it's related to the glitch we had early on with the uh, the audio being weird. And oh, that's because my speaker's on. <laughs> so I couldn't hear it. So you guys got to hear the uh, intro song if you were on the live stream a couple of times. But that's what happens sometimes, guys, when we're producing our own shows. Like I'm the producer. I'm the content content creator. I'm the talent. I'm the secretary. And sometimes we just like fumble that ball. And I fumbled a ball today, apparently. Okay. So we're going to talk about starting seeds and I'm coming at this from a beginner's mindset, but I will add some commentary about things that if you've already done your own seedlings before might help your seedlings be better. Feel free to ask me questions along the way on this guys, because I think this is a great year to, to learn something new if you haven't done it before. Those of you new to homesteading, it's a great way to save money starting your own seedlings. But you can go down this like rabbit hole of A, overthinking it, and B, spending way too much money on stuff you don't need when you don't even know if you like it. So we're going to just talk about my thoughts on like the first year of starting seeds and then some additional ideas of doing seedlings, you know, as you get better and better at it. But there is a way you can spend a little bit of money and really set your, yourself up for success versus the windowsill method. Although the first time I ever started seeds, it was the windowsill method. Now, before we go into all of that, though, I'm going to do all of our usual Monday segments, starting with the featured event of today's show, February 25th in Westmoreland, Tennessee. Sean Mills is doing a solar installation workshop for $50. The link is in the show notes. But if you go to livingfreeintennessee.com and look where the events are in the side column, it'll take you straight there. Check that out. I know it'll be a fun one to just get the basics of learning how to plan for your solar and install it. Battery, inverter, panels, all good stuff. February 25th, 
And it's a pretty darn good price for a solo workshop, I might add. I also want to thank our two sponsors of today's show. The first one is Discount Mylar Bags. Toby over at Discount Mylar Bags is a fellow Tennessean and a friend. I've known him before he created his retirement business. In fact, when I met Toby, he was doing this as a side hustle, working full time at Dollar General, sourcing things in bulk for Dollar General so that they could sell them for cheaper at Dollar General. And he was like, I'm in these prepper groups, but I have no skills to add. And then he realized, actually, I'm pretty good at sourcing stuff in bulk and passing on those savings to people at Dollar General. Why don't I do that for the network? Because he was getting frustrated just looking at all the quote unquote prepper supplies and the markup because he's like, listen, I know I can get like a, a container full of Mylar bags, for example, for a lot less than you can buy a 10 pack of Mylar bags. So he started discountmylarbags.com to pass on those savings to all of us in the prepper network. And then he put together some thoughts on how to store your food. And those are in the right-hand column of his site. Definitely check that out. If nothing else, the resources are free. Discountmylarbags.com. Our second sponsor of today's show delivers delicious fresh roasted coffee to your doorstep anywhere in the US or FPO and APO mailboxes. Unless you're in Germany, in which case apparently you get in trouble because I'm not supposed to mail coffee to Germany military bases, to German military bases. Anyway, Holler Roast is the second sponsor of today's show. If you want to support the show, a great way to do that is start with your morning cup of joe. With that, it's time for the first segment of today's show, and that's Tales from the Prepper Pantry. This is where we talk about using what you store and storing what you use, which is a basic fundamental premise of my pantry management. In fact, I was doing pantry management before I realized I was well, I'm so, sort of a prepper. And it's because as a homesteader, especially when you're out in rural worlds, um, you end up with a long trip to the grocery store. And I had it dialed in to where I could just go once a month and be fine. And then over time, as I got better at homesteading and better at producing our own food here, I realized I needed the store less and less and less. And that all came down to A, good pantry management skills and B, when, when you become self-reliant in something, like I talked about being garlic self-reliant on Friday, you're reproducing it on site and you don't have to get it. And those two things have kind of overlapped. But here's what was up in the pantry this week. I have mason jar storage challenges. So since redoing my kitchen floor, which required the removal of all my lower kitchen cabinets. So I don't have storage in the lower kitchen cabinets anymore because there aren't any. I have bins full of mason jars full of things and they, they are dried things. So I store my teas and my dried herbs and my dried whatever and nuts and you know, what anything I would store are in mason jars because I realized early on, if I have a consistent shape and size of thing, it's easier to build shelving for it or, you know, arrange the shelves in your lower cabinets. Well, I don't have lower cabinets anymore. And I have bins and I can't find anything. So I'm starting to put some thought to what the next two years in my kitchen look like from a storage standpoint of mason jar jars filled with stuff. Like all of my usual pantry storage areas with mason jars that are not in my kitchen are covered. But in the kitchen, like it's actually kind of a it's not just a glancing blow. It's kind of a fatal blow to my organization to not have places to put the jars. So I'm feeling a lot of sympathy for people who have very small kitchens and not lots of places to put them. That being said, I have seen a number, like I've been doing the pantry porn thing where you go out and you, uh, you have to make sure the R is in the word pantry when you type this in Google and don't type the word porn, but you go out there and you see what pantry storage ideas people have had. And um, there's a certain, there's like the scale of how much effort I'm willing to put in. Like, I want something that will last for two years. It doesn't have to be super beautiful finished product because I plan to have to custom make cabinetry in my kitchen, which will then have built in storage for the teas and the herbs and the other dried goods. So uh, that being said, 
I will share with you some things that I find out, but something that struck me today was that if it's dry goods, there's no reason the jars can't store on their sides. And then I can see like, I can see rather than front to back stuff, I can have more variety going vertically on the side. So to be like bee balm, you know, mint, uh, echinacea, whatever all the way up because the other thing is I also for the herbal the herbal stuff I collect I don't keep more than two jars of it usually I don't keep a lot unless it's something I use a lot like the chocolate mint tea that's my one of my favorite kinds of tea and so I have a ton of it I keep that in half gallon mason jars but the other stuff are just you know like I'll have you know pint jars I have pint jars of ganesha flower leaves for example or I have, I even have like jelly jars with the rose petals because they shrink so much when you dry them. It's like, no, I don't need to waste all of that air just by having this half full jar. So anyway, really playing around with some of those. And I really want to balance between easy to build and I'm not going to be sad when it's gone. Or, you know, some of it may be some longer term storage. Like I could totally do a row of sideways facing dry good mason jars along one side of my upper cabinets, which did not have to be pulled out and are still there. And I'm basically happy with them. So that's all fun. I'll share, I'll share some video on that as we go. And as we make things, I'm refining the apothecary, which means that I'm looking at things that I've stored for two or three years dried and making sure that I adjust how much of that every year I store, because my goal with the herbal apothecary that I have is that each season I harvest and I dry and I store, and then I use it up, or if it's something like comfrey, which I may not need to use in high amounts every year, like if I sprain an ankle, I'm going to use more than if I don't sprain an ankle. And we try not to sprain ankles around here. So I want to keep enough of that on hand for healing purposes, but I want it to be fresh. So there needs to be, you know, where I can see what I have the right volume for most of our needs and then a way to, you know, like, and then I rotate it through, like there's going to be a point where I have fresh comfrey, then I can ditch all the dried comfrey and start afresh. And that dry comfrey makes a great garden compost slash supplement. So there's, you know, it all just gets returned to the same system. And I use comfrey as an example, because we are also comfrey independent here. Like, it would take a major thing happening for me not to have comfrey to dry every year because every time I turn around, there is more comfrey on my property because it's such a good plant just to have around. Like it chokes out other plants. I don't have to mow where it is. It grows leaves that work great in the garden as a, as a soil amendment. Like all of those things are pretty cool about comfrey. And then People come here once a year to my spring workshop and I'm like, take some comfrey, take some comfrey. Like I have spread comfrey all over the place. Also, Ryan, the homestead consultant gave me a variety that's, that, that self-propagates and just kind of blows in the wind. And then you end up with a new comfrey plant. So something I'm perfectly happy with. Other people would not like that because they feel like it's invasive. It's not invasive to me. Like if one grows where I don't want it, I just dig it up. It's fine. And then it, you actually can kill comfrey by not giving it enough water or light. You just got to keep on it. It's kind of like Jerusalem artichokes in that way. Um, this week's strategy is that we started all of our meal planning with all the meat. So I went into the freezer and I went into that place in the freezer and I ended up just grabbing a whole bunch of stuff that needed to be eaten up. So we're having four different kinds of, no, three different kinds of animal ribs, beef, pork, and lamb this week and other things. So we're just basically starting with all the meat and then I'm doing side dishes. And as a result, I don't have room in my fridge for anything else right now. Like I took yesterday, I just, I came out with a big basket and I filled it full of meat. And I'm like, I don't even know what's in here. Took it into the kitchen and divide it by ca category of what it is. You know, like all the ribs here, all the chops there, you know, whatever else is in there. Oh, ground. <laughs> I'm sorry. Woo! Got a sneeze in there today too. That, that sneeze was no extra charge. Yeah, I've got a bunch of ground beef that is defrosting too. It'll be defrosted by tomorrow so I can make hamburger patties so that in times of high volume like workload for me, 
a very easy dinner is to take a frozen hamburger patty or four and like saute them up and serve hamburgers. Although we do a keto version. So we use like lettuce wraps or no wraps, uh, very satisfying dinner with side dishes. And it's one of my quick and easy meals I can do. So we're going to be making hamburger patties this year, rather than me just buying like bags of them, which is what I used to do. But it's really stupid when you buy a whole animal, not to use the whole animal. Plus, I can add the spices I like to that because the ones you get at the store taste like nothing like they're not even salted. And so you got to add spices to them as you go. Well, why not mix that all in and then make the patties? And yeah, that's the plan as we move forward. And Tactical and I've been working together kind of closely from a consumer producer standpoint, since I produce most of the food here. Um, you know, like, how do I say that? It's not that he doesn't produce food because he produces sheep that get processed into food. But I mean, like I take it and I make it into things we can eat. So I do most of that work. And, and I've been trying to find ways so that when I'm out of town for a couple of days at a time, it's very easy for him to eat, even though he's perfectly capable of cooking more complex meals, especially when the second person on the homestead's not here, there's not as much time. So those hamburger patties are just, I'm doing kind of one project like that a week. Last week, it was breakfast sausage. This week, it's hamburger patties. I'm going to start the bacon next week, all of it. Okay, so I've got a question in that does relate to the to the prepper pantry. So I'm going to answer it. William asks, what do you use to dry everything? And how do you know it's completely dry so it doesn't mold in storage? This is a great question. I dry most of the herbal stuff I get flat on cookie sheets. If I have, I have these racks that I can put on them that are like cookie drying racks. But if it's something like rose petals, which may be like the wild rose petals I get are too small, I'll put a paper towel down and I just open air dry them in my kitchen separate from sunlight hitting them. So I don't put them through my Excalibur food dehydrator, which I do have an Excalibur food dehydrator that I can also use. So, and I'm just talking herbal stuff. So like if I'm doing beet greens, if I'm doing basil, if I'm doing echinacea flower, all of that, the floral things. So like red clover, when I collect that, I collect them before the sun hits them in the morning. I bring them inside put them out so they get some airflow. And it usually takes a week or two to dry in my house. How do I know they're dry enough? I guess. So when it's been a couple of weeks, I like feel them. And if they seem dry enough, then I will put them in a jar. And if they don't seem dry enough, then I'll wait. And very occasionally they just, it's like too humid in the air in my house and they just don't dry and it doesn't work. But most of the time it works fine. You can make this, you can improve your success rate by putting them, you know, like blowing a fan gently on them, but like they're leaves, they will flow, you know, like fly around. And then the other thing I've started doing for some things, like especially my herbs, is I freeze them and then I freeze dry them. And that works really great. But for the medicinal stuff, I wasn't sure how the properties uh, translate for use freeze dried versus dried. So I've just sort of stayed with the same practice I always learned, which is just to dry them at room temperature. When you add heat, it can break down some of the volatile oils, which you don't want to do if you're using them medicinally. Uh, plus, I don't know, it takes less management. Like the peppermint, I'll have, I'll have like big baskets of it. And the key is to have airflow because if you just like densely pack that in there, it won't work. But I've actually gotten that done by hanging them up in bunches as well. That's the other way. I do it. If I had to though, and use the Excalibur, so the older models, you can run the fan in the Excalibur without any heat. And that would work great. Uh, I'll put it on the lowest setting for, for the herbs. So, um, but as far as no mold and storage, I just wait till I know they're good and dry. I don't use a humidity tester of any kind. And I'm right 99% of the time. It's very rare that I have something not working. I'm more likely to make that mistake with the freeze dryer than I do with the air dried stuff. So, and the second question I have in related details from the prepper pantry is what's your favorite herb to grow? I don't have one. Uh, I am garlic independent and I consider that an herb because it's a spice. You know, it's used as a spice. I love rosemary. It does not love me, but we, we actually have a couple rosemary plants alive on the property right now. So that's a success. I grow the 
crumbs out of sage and basil and thyme and marjoram, tarragon. Like I grow a lot of different herbs here and none of them are, I just like growing herbs because I like eating herbs and they make my food taste good. So I wish, I'll tell you the ones that have like been the bane of my existence are ginger and turmeric, which grow in a similar way. Uh, I wish I was better at growing those, but I'm not very good at growing those. So maybe one day I'll get good at growing those herbs. Tomorrow's Fat Tuesday and we make crepes on Fat Tuesday. So we had a holler neighbor meeting yesterday. Nighthawk hosted the meal and just sort of, here's how we approach them. I said, hey, we're doing crepes. We've got to talk about this. What do we want for the crepes? I'm like, this is what I have to add to crepes. And then the Eversouls are like, this is what we have. And we need to use up this meat in the fridge. And I was like, perfect. So it's a great way to use up little odds and ends because you can put a little bit of something in there and make a good savory crepe. Or if you want a sweet one, you can do whatever. Like they have powdered sugar and I don't because I don't usually cook with it. So I have like maple syrup though. So we can do maple syrup and powdered sugar, which is a lot of sweet if you're not used to sweet. Uh, I've got jams and jellies I've made over the years and uh, chocolate. So that's what the sweet crepes will be. And then we just have all sorts of different additions for the other one. So it'll be kind of, it'll be a fun little thing. This is a tradition I picked up gosh, in my early days in the SCA in Ashland, Oregon, from um, from a, a couple I knew there where they did it every every Fat Tuesday. And the fun thing about crepes is you make them sort of like one at a time and you everybody can choose whatever they want in their crepe. And that, so the way we usually do it here is I'm like, I'll make the first one, but you got to make your next one. And we just keep cycling through and you just hang out and have a good time. So that's happening tomorrow. And to, to support that, I'm actually making crepes with wheat. I'll be grinding wheat from my wheat stores because I don't want to buy a bag of flour for like, I need two to three cups of flour. So we're just going to use the Vitamix and do it that way. Um, the consistency of the batter from flour made in the, in the Vitamix is a little bit different. It's so it's a little coarser, but not bad. And it works out fine. You just have to get your ratio of egg to milk to flour to work for you. That's, that's all you have to do. Um, and of course, I complained about egg pikers last year, and today Tactical walked in with the first duck egg since the last time the ducks were laying. Well, I'm pretty sure they've been hiding their eggs. So we cooked the egg up and cut it exactly in half for breakfast, but I have eggs to make the crepes with just in time. Okay, next up. Okay, so the weekly shopping report usually happens, but I did not see it in time for the show today, so... Um, I'm sure it'll come out sometimes this week. It just depends on how much time Joe has. We'll put that in the next show. So we're going to go straight into the frugality tip, which I got from Rebecca from Red Flyer Media. And she said this, for your DIY construction projects, you can get free lumber, hardware, PEX, electric, electrical supplies, and even tools. And the way she does this is she goes out and looks for like building contractors who do smaller projects, like one to five houses at a time. They have to pay cleanup crews to haul excess lumber and they rent dumpsters. And sometimes they have to pay extra by weight for them to be emptied. So what she's figured out is if you see houses being built, stop by and talk to the contractor about if it's okay to dumpster dive or collecting leftovers, uh, they usually say, okay, because you're doing them a favor. They have to pay to get rid of the extra stuff, right? So here's a list of what she's gotten by doing this. She's gotten half inch pe pecs, about 150 feet, which is great for a smaller project, right? So like for a whole house, actually, that's not bad for a whole house either, but crews don't like to mess with like smaller segments, like 10 to 30 feet. And so they'll just like throw it away. Well, if you're just going like six feet and then around a corner, that's perfect for you. Why not get it for free? Three strand wire. Um, it's great for uh, heavy duty wire she's gotten. She's gotten 220 wire. She's gotten two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, trim pieces. And most of the new lumber that was extra at the end of a house build was like longer lengths of it. So that worked really well for her. She's gotten insulation, pipe insulation, door hardware, cabinet hardware, plumbing hardware. 
this is a pretty good tip if you're looking to build out your dream home and you're willing to like do a little bit and you're taking your time, right? You can do a little bit of dumpster diving, but you can do it with the permission of contractors that you develop relationships with. And then they'll get into the habit of calling you when they have something they're like, Hey, we didn't use this bathroom vanity. Do you want it? Um, Ryan Steva is the master at this. Like he'll call me ever so often and be like, Hey, I found this, whatever. And I'll, he, do you want it? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> cause he, he has an idea of what I'm working on in the house. Cause we hire him to do work here. Anyway, next up we have operation independence. This is where we talk about the local ongoing revenue in our life. And today I'm not going to talk about money. You know why? Because money isn't everything to me. And if you are on the weekly email, which if you're not, you can go to livingfreeintennessee.com and, and sign up. I say a little bit at the beginning of the email, we feature what we did last week. We talk about the live stream schedule this week, and then we have a few other sections. And I mentioned this week that I sent off an email to somebody. It took me two weeks to answer it. And I was like, so sorry. It took me so long, blah, 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 blah. And I told him why. And the reason why was that I have been prioritizing making time to work out, to make sure I eat right, to develop my closer relationships, and to take care of my mental health. What that means is I've had to give up time somewhere. Now, one of the places I've given up some time is I, I'm getting up an hour earlier every day now. And sometimes that means I crash earlier at night and other times I just go to bed at my normal time. And if I'm tired, tired, I sleep. Like I don't use a, an alarm clock unless I have a flight to catch or something of that nature. So that practice has given me a, a, like a little bit more productivity because I'm a person who's more productive between waking and noon. Like that time period, I can get three or four times the amount of stuff done as I, I usually do from afternoon, uh, like noon into the evening. I do different kinds of projects because my brain is working in, a, in sort of like in a different vibration mode after lunch. So I think it's important to build yourself and your health into your schedule, whatever that looks like for you. When we talk to John Willis, like he talks about how hard he works and he works really hard and he works really fast. And when he's focused on something like he knocks it out. Right. Um, but he also gets up early and works out and does his day and works out again. Like he also builds time in for himself. I know that he and Amanda get a massage once a, a, a once a week. Cause I've been there when they're like, Oh, the masseuse is here. We got to go. And I was actually talking to tactical this morning. I'm like, I actually, I hundred percent see why they do that. Because like yesterday I made time instead of working, I made, I took three hours to go swim because it takes me an hour to drive to the pool. It takes me an hour to swim and it takes me an hour to drive home from the pool because I live in a pool desert. There is not a pool here for lap swimming that like, that's, you know, I can, I can go an hour, one of four ways, but like all four directions no pool for lap swimming. And so I do that every Sunday as sort of a treat to myself. And because of that, I didn't work those three hours. And then I invested in relationships with the Holler neighbors last night. So I hung out with them instead of doing an evening work session. Um, from the operation independence standpoint, what I'm finding is when I do work, I get a lot more done. Like today, I got a ton done from when I, I woke up because I came into the day mentally healthy, like physically I'm feeling better and better the more I'm consistent with my exercise. And that meant I was sharper and more able to do things. So from an operation independence standpoint, investing in yourself is as important as figuring out ways to, you know, not have to spend the money to pay a guy or earn more money. Just my thoughts there. Before we go into the main topic of today's show, I do want to talk about our live stream schedule this week. Um, obviously, I'm live now, but tomorrow at 1230, I'll be live with uh, Sunny Puzikas, who is the person who was teaching the Fight Like a Girl self-defense class at Self-Reliance Festival. That class, I think, because he's taking the approach of tapping into strengths and weaknesses to win... I think that's a very important class if you're somebody who wants to get better at 
getting yourself out of situations that you accidentally find yourself in where you do have to defend yourself, right? So check that out. That's selfrelianceFestival.com. But he'll be on with John Willis and me tomorrow at 1230. On Wednesday, I have an interview show. We're talking about septic systems and water treatment on your homestead. So I think you're going to love that one. Thursday, 7 p.m., the Self-Reliance Festival Live will happen. And then, of course, Friday at 9.30, we have homestead happenings. But I'm also driving to Camden to get my car repaired. So depending on how that drive works, uh, it may be a distance live stream or we may end up slightly shifting the schedule. It really depends on how long it takes me to get to Camden, what time the mechanic wants my car, like all of those things. So just keep your eye out on the social networks. We've got a great Telegram group. We've got a MeWe group. There's a Facebook group. Like pay attention on social media on Friday in case that timing shifts. With that, it is time for the main topic of today's show. I want to remind those of you in the live stream, if you have questions as you go, do what William Starr did and put question in all caps and then the rest of your question. That way I know you want me to work it in, especially today's topic is a pretty tangible, hands-on sort of thing. So we are talking about starting seeds for beginners, but I'm going to add a few tips for people who have done it a while. And if you have a more advanced question, ask it. If I know the answer, I will answer it. And if I don't, It'll give me something to read about later this week, <laughs> All right? Let's start with the first and most important question about starting seeds. Why try? Why would you make, let's say you're new to a homestead, you're doing your garden for the first time. Why would you try to do seeds this year? Now, the savvy person might say, you shouldn't try this year. You should just buy your seedlings. But Here's my thought about seedlings and starting seedlings is the barrier to entry from a financial standpoint is not very high for a very basic setup. And by very basic setup, I mean, I mean, beyond just the little tray you can buy with the plastic top at Walmart that you put in your windowsill, although that is, you know, less than 20 bucks. And I've had success with those. Like, Totally had success with those. I, I've also had challenges with them, but I've had success with those. So if that's all you can do, that's what you do. We'll talk about what you can do with that as we get into some of the specs. But with a little bit of investment in some fairly easy to use tools, you have a very good chance of having decent success your first year. And if you're going to do that, choose a couple kinds of plants that you might like to have in your garden and try. Because it is cheaper than buying the plants at the store or from somebody else. And if you fail, you can always buy them at the store or some from somebody else. And you're learning a skill. It increases your self-reliance because if you're able, if you know the skill of starting the seedlings, then you can save the seeds and use them next year. And A, you don't have to buy the seeds next year. And you become kind of like I'm garlic independent. You might become tomato independent. We are actually tomato independent here too. Uh, asterisk. I don't grow all of 100% of my tomatoes. Like Rick, who's in our network, brought me extra tomatoes and I canned those this year, right? And I've been known to buy tomatoes. I didn't buy tomatoes last season, but I've definitely been known to buy 50 or hundred pounds of tomatoes because I wanted that much more sauce. But uh, if you can start the seedlings and save the seeds, you end up independent in that category or in, in whatever it is you do that for. And you can be relatively confident over time, especially if you're saving from the best plants that you're getting better and better and more predictable stock that is tailored to your area. I think the most important thing is though, I find growing seedlings to be fun. It's one of my favorite parts of gardening. Like I like harvesting and I like processing and I like doing the seedlings and that part in between, I do it so that I can do those two other things. Okay. The weeding, the cultivating. Eh, eh. If somebody else came into the holler and they're like, you know what I like doing? I like it after they've been transplanted. I really just like to cultivate and I don't want to do anything else. I'd be like, awesome. We're going to work really well together. Um, 
so then the next question comes up, what could go wrong if you start your own seedlings? And the, the biggest thing that could go wrong is it doesn't work. You fail. You might not end up growing exactly what you want that year if you're fully dependent on seedlings that you grow. But, you know, you'll grow something. It's kind of like when you put a lot of variety into your garden. Every year I have something fail. Every year I have something do super well. Like we had a great green bean year last year. <laughs> That's good because the year before it sucked. You know, like it's changing every year. Um, pests could wipe you out. Like literally you could be growing stuff in your house without importing any pests at all that you know of. And still somehow the thrips get in there, or the aphids get in there and they, and they wipe you out. And once again, you're back at the store buying seedlings. You could spend tons of money on equipment, fail, walk away. That's the other thing that could go wrong. Don't do that. If you're starting seeds for the first time this year, I think choose an amount of money you're willing to invest. 50 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. For 100 bucks, you can get a lot done. You can get a lot done for 100. I'd actually go the 100 bucks if you're going to do it. But don't invest 800 bucks in this whole system that you buy that's off the shelf. Don't do that. It, it's a bad idea because then if you hate it, you are stuck with a hundred bucks worth of equipment. I say this for canning too, like borrow somebody's canner and can something before you buy the canner. A, you'll learn what kind of canner you like and B, you'll learn if you like canning. But also know this, like failure happens and it's okay. Prepare for it. Part of gardening is killing plants. I am not a gardener. I'm a plant murderer. It's just that through murdering plants, I have learned how to cultivate plants and I have more success than I did when I just murdered plants all along. Because I remember my very first garden, I had this notion that you just like cut the grass out and throw the stuff in and they'll grow. And then you have to keep all the weeds away and bare earth. And that didn't work that great. Like even that year I got something, but man, I think about what like mulching and all the other things I've learned to do in composting and how much better my garden is compared to that first one. But had I never done it poorly, had I never had that first very dense Oregon clay, bare ground, crappy garden where I still managed to get Brussels sprouts because it was Oregon. It's, it's like hard to fail Brussels sprouts in Oregon. I wouldn't be where I am today. So if, if you're terrified of failure, find a way to put that aside because like literally you're going to kill plants. You are a plant murderer if you are a garden and have a backup plan. If you're doing this to improve your life and to lower your grocery bill, have a backup plan for how you can also do that if for whatever reason your tomatoes don't do well. Because with backup plans and community and relationships, you can get through a lot. The backup plan may look like having relationships with farmers at your farmer's market so that when they have surplus and too much of something, you can get it for free or cheap or for trading your canning skills or whatever, right? Uh, that's happened to me a lot uh, with my farmer's market here because I used to sell at the farmer's market. So I had like extra good relationships with the farmers there. And like you guys know, two years ago, I got all the broccoli I needed for a whole winter for like 20 bucks or something. <laughs> he charged me a dollar a plant. And the only pain in the neck I had was I had to go to his place to get it. And I learned something about broccoli. If, if you get all of these plants that are just pulled out by the roots, they have dirt in the roots. And if you bring them into your kitchen to cut off the part you want, you end up with a lot of dirt on your kitchen floor. And next time I'll do that outside. But all of that was a great learning experience. And I ended up with tons of broccoli for almost no money for the whole winter. I just freeze dried it, put it in jars. It was delicious all winter long. One year, I, because I've been doing seedlings for years and I'm friends with people, a friend of mine and I grow some of the same heirloom varieties, right? Oh, come on, Siegler. Everybody needs a ton of broccoli. Anyway, that was a comment that I just saw. But one year... I was growing all my tomato starts and my friend was growing all her tomato starts. And at that time she was not as into automating watering as usual. And it ended up, she was trying to dry garden and all of her tomato starts failed because it would, they like dried out on a critical day. And she called me 
and she was like, I have nothing. I, I'm, and she was doing a CSA. Okay. Like she's a really good gardener. And she's like, I got nothing. I think I'm just going to cancel the CSA. And I'm like, well, what's the problem? She's like, all of my tomatoes are dead in my greenhouse. Like, I don't know what happened, but they're all dead. And it was, you know, late April at that point, like it's time for tomatoes to go out. And I said, well, as it turns out, I have about a hundred extra tomato plants if you want them. And I gave them to her. So I ended up being her backup plan. And then subsequently last year, when I got really behind on doing my tomato starts, because I was focusing on self-reliance festival and not on actually starting my seeds, I had to confess to her that I didn't have tomato plants. And she ended up giving me, she's like, well, I've only got 12 extra tomato plants. She gave me 30 extra tomato plants. <laughs> I, I, I in turn gave some away to some other people. And I ended up starting the one variety that's most important to me to grow every year late. And that one produced two. So, you know, like the more you have those local relationships, the better off you are, in my opinion. So let's go into the seed st starting part of this. So let's start with seeds. What kind of seeds should you use if you're going to start plants from seed, guys? Should you get heirloom? Should you get hybrid? Like, what do you think from a beginning standpoint is most important? I think it doesn't matter. I think it's a great idea to grow the seeds you like. Now, I'm not opposed to a hybrid variety of rose or tomato or whatever. All that means is that if you save seeds from those, you may end up with a totally different plant from the little seeds, the babies that they make, rather than an heirloom variety, which you can save the seeds from. This is like I'm using tomatoes as, as, as an example. If you save seeds from heirloom squash, you may still get something else because if it crosses with another squash in your garden that year, the seeds that you get are going to be a different plant. So it just sort of depends how you want to approach that. I saw somebody post the other day asking if it was illegal to save, save seeds from your garden. And I think that's the wrong question to ask. I think the right question to ask is how do I save seeds from my garden? The seed police are not highly motivated to go after Joe Gardner for saving seeds and replanting them, even if it is a protected variety of seed that has some sort of a patent on it that says you can't save it. A, B, most of the stuff that we are growing in our gardens is not patented like that. Like it could be, but it's very, very unlikely. So, and then see how the heck are they going to find out? Like literally like, you'd have to invite people on your property to genetically test your tomato to know if you somehow stole the tomato. Where you can run into trouble is if you are redistributing the seeds, making money on it, and then they figure out that you have some sort of patented seed. That's where it matters. Where it does not matter is in your, I don't think it matters. I'm like, I am, maybe I take more risks than a lot of people, but there's not a huge risk there for saving your seeds. So the next question to ask is what sort of seedlings should a beginner? So, so the answer to the question, what kind of seeds is it's all okay. Hybrid plants that are the kind of plants your local farmers grow in your area which is a great question to ask. I'm like, what kind of carrots do you grow? What kind of tomatoes do you grow? Why do you grow those? Those may do better against diseases and pests in your area than trying to do some of these funky looking heirloom varieties. But I know that I get a lot of satisfaction putting my effort into funky looking heirloom varieties because it's more fun to grow a weird colored tomato than a normal colored tomato. And that's just how my brain works. Your brain, you may just want the perfect red, round tomato. That's up to you. So what should you grow via seedlings? I like to grow tomatoes via seedlings. And a lot of people do not like, they, they find tomatoes hard to grow. And mm, they're not wrong, but same time, you're probably going to try tomatoes no matter what. Peppers are great. Um, broccoli, lettuce. Lufa works great from seed, Swiss chard, kale, 
What I don't like to do from seeds are peas. I don't like to transplant peas or beans. I like to start in the garden. I prefer to start my cucumbers and squashes in the garden. Although in recent years through very careful handling, I have managed to transplant them without hurting their roots. So it is possible. Carrots and other root veggies, I prefer to direct seed into the ground. So I would say choose, if it's your first year, choose a couple of things and, and try them. Uh, question from the live audience is, how do you prevent seeds growing like trees before it's the third leaf? I use a heating pad in a mini table greenhouse and they keep growing like weeds before transplant. So I think what you're asking me is, how do I keep my seedlings from getting leggy? And the answer is light. Your light needs to be very, very like closer than you ever thought to the seedlings. Otherwise they're going to stretch up to the light. So if you're not using additional lighting and you're just doing the windowsill, that's when you end up with leggy plants. If you do that with a tomato, you can fill in the dirt up the stem and it will be fine. If you do that with a broccoli plant, that trick doesn't work as well. So it also kind of depends on the plant. And as we get into like, there are four areas to think about as you're getting ready to do seedlings. First one is light. So I'm glad you brought up that question, Hogs14. The second one is heat. The third one is watering. And the fourth one is soil mix. So let's start with the lighting because this is the thing that like in our heads, we're thinking we're going to start seedlings. We're going to buy that mini greenhouse from Walmart. We're going to put it in the windowsill where the sun is and that's enough light. It is not enough light in most places. It will work. You can make it work. But if you want to have better success, it is worth investing in some grow lights. The, the Barina grow lights, which I learned about from Jack Spearco, work great. Now, the last time I did a how to grow from seedling show, I was using these square LED, like sun spectrum level lights. So they don't use a ton of power. And those square ones work great too. So if you already have one of those, use what you have, if, especially if it's your first time. But Barina makes these lights. I have a link in the show notes for y'all. Uh, where you can get them on Amazon for a two a set of two foot ones. It's like 59 bucks right now for a set of four foot ones. It's 89 bucks. I'm going to buy the four foot ones this year because I have the old purple ones, which are great for plants, but they make my eyes hurt in my living room. And I'm going to get the ones that are white light <laughs> basically so that I can have a four foot growing section under my window in the kitchen. And it's the daylight equivalent is what I'm doing there. Those grow lights don't take a ton of power. They're very easy to install. Um, you know, you can just hang them on a shelf. You can screw them into places. There's all sorts of different ways that you can hang those lights. Um, but the key to success with lighting your seedlings is when they poke up out of the soil, you want the light almost right on top of them. Because if it's any distance away, they're going to reach up and then you're going to end up with the problem of leggy plants. So when I start seedlings, I make sure my lights are ready to go. I actually don't keep my lights on. I turn them on after germination happens, but I make sure it's ready to go and that there's a way I can either raise the lights as the plants grow or I can lower the plants as the light um, I mean, as the plants grow, uh, lowering the plant, is actually, in my opinion, a little bit easier. Like the Barina lights, you can put them on a pulley system and they can go up and down. They come with wires to do that with. But what I do is I have them at the top of the shelf and I just take whatever random Amazon box or, you know, piece of lumber gets them where I want. It gets that tray of plants up there where I want it. And then I remove things to make them go lower. So I don't do anything fancy there. And I've been doing this for 17 years now. So what do you do though, if you don't have any lights and you cannot get lights? Mm. Be prepared for leggy plants, but you can put it in your windowsill and you will get a plant. It's just, mm like the, the lights make all the difference or you start your seeds later. 
and you transplant them later. You may get like, if you have more hours of light, then you won't have this problem as much, but they're still going to, you're going to see your plants like lean towards the window and then you turn it around they lean the other way and then they lean and then they lean. You can also take an actual like desk lamp and put it really close to your plants. I've done that. It works better than nothing, but for $59, you can get a set of two foot lights and that'll that's two of those is enough to do one tray of seedlings. One tray of seedlings is enough to give you 36 plants or so. 36 plants is a lot of plants for your first year gardening. Like you can do tomatoes, you can do peppers, you can do all sorts of things. If you have different kinds of plants in one tray, what's going to happen is some of them are going to grow faster than others. So you're going to end up with some weird light dyslexia. If you have two lights, in this case, you want to be able to raise in lower lights. If you have two lights, put the plants that are getting taller on one side under one light and the ones that are shorter under the other. So you can have the lights at two levels. That's, that's what you do there. Okay, the second thing to think about is soil temperature. It took me years to get over my resistance to this. And it took, I would put, so you can put the soil in the pots, put the seeds in the soil and put it on like whatever shelf you're going to use and have the lights over it. And the heat from the lights will help. They will eventually germinate. I germinate most of my tomato seeds in three days they're up. How do you do that, Nicole? I use heat mats. I discovered heat mats when I had my greenhouse. I don't even have a greenhouse here anymore. I don't need one. So I had a greenhouse though, because we were, we were starting hundreds of basil plants for transplanting at different restaurants around Nashville. And so I needed to master the process of germination and growing these plants out so that we could put them in, you know, like what, the original concept was one thing. I won't go into that right now because it's, it's a huge like squirrel trail, but we just needed lots of plants and we needed them on a schedule. So it was like I had in my greenhouse, it was like week one, week two, week three, for up to week six when it left. And at this time of year, it gets cold at night and you don't want your plants to get cold at night, particularly the roots, particularly basil. It's very sensitive to getting cold. So I ordered some seedling mats, a seedling mat. I just learned today because they were $25 when I ordered them. It's like 13 bucks on Amazon. That link is in the show notes and the seedling mat. The way it works is you plug it in and it raises the, um, the temperature 20 degrees. What this means is if you have it plugged in and it's 50 degrees outside, your soil is 70 degrees. If it's 60 degrees outside, it's 80 degrees. If it's 70 degrees outside or in your house, it's 90 degrees. If it's 90 degrees in your greenhouse, it kills the plants because it's another 20 degrees. So keep that in mind if you're using seedling mats, that they're not on a thermostat. You can actually get a thermostat plug that makes that turns on and off based on the temperature you set outside or, you know, for, for the plug. But if you have them in a greenhouse and your greenhouse is getting up to 90 degrees during the day, you do not want your seedling mats on, but 90 degrees for a lot of seedlings makes them really, really, really happy. So I love the mats for stability. I love the mats for speed of germination. I love the mats for seeds that are hard to germinate, like cilantro. Cilantro is one that that I've had to work to learn how to germinate. That's why it's not on your first year start it list. And the other thing I learned with having my greenhouse the way it was, is that there was a, there was a enough of a temperature variation that starting seedlings in my house, even though I have a greenhouse works way better. And if you can't get seedling mats, you can't afford that extra $12 for the seedling mat. The top of your refrigerator is warm. You just have to remember to check the top of your ref refrigerator um, to keep it watered right. So that's the second thing is soil temperature. If your soil temperature is not right, your, your, your germination doesn't happen the same way and the plant can get sad when it does germinate. And then you're like, wild variation in temperature. And then it's, you know, it'll be like, I'm happy. I'm not happy. I'm happy. I'm not happy. Uh, I have found with peppers in particular, when I want to germinate those, I put the, uh, 
the seedling mats on a uh, 16 to 18 hour on off cycle. So 18 hours on and then the rest off. And that variation in temperature to get the germination for my like jalapeno pepper seeds works great. Tomatoes, I just keep it consistent. Broccoli, I keep it consistent. Cilantro, I keep it consistent. Peppers, for whatever reason, seem to like the variation. And that's something you can experiment year to year because eventually peppers do germinate. Peppers are the most frustrating germination in my whole thing because they like they seem to take longer than I want them to, especially when tomatoes are like, I'm here in three days. But that's just my own impression of that. So then the next thing to think about is how are you watering the plants? Consistent moisture and not overwatering is really important. And the biggest mistake that I see people do with their seedlings is inconsistent watering. They'll be like, why isn't it working well? Well, did it dry out all the way because you were at work? And then you added water. Plants don't like that when they're that young. Are you overwatering? It, either way, it could go. And back when I first started talking about how to do seedlings, I recommended that you check in twice a day, feel the soil with your finger, make sure it's perfect. My life got a lot easier when I discovered what a water table was. And it was from... Um, a friend of mine who does microgreens in New Hampshire, John Dowie from Dowie Farms. And he said, well, why don't you just get a water table, Nicole? And I looked at, I didn't buy one, but I took the concept of the water table and I got a plant tray, like the square plant trays that a lot of them have holes in them. You can get them without holes and they're about an inch tall and they fit perfectly. Um, eight six packs of pots like little individual plant pots in there and the plant pots are taller than the tray and if you put water in the tray and the bottom of those pots is in the water it wicks up exactly what the plant needs uh, for doing the germination yeah the water table so you can without buying a water table just get one of those trays and you can go to the store, you can go to, so in Cookville, you can go to the greenhouse supply store and get one. If you, if you see trays at Walmart or somewhere, they usually have holes in those trays. You don't want that. You want something that holds water. If you don't have that, you can take a Tupperware and put your six packs in the Tupperware with water in that till they germinate and then figure out how you're going to keep, keep just the bottom of the pot wet. Uh, so that they, you know, they reach down for the water and wick that water up. But that's sort of like my redneck style water table is just to use the trays like that. I have put a link to the plant tray in the show notes. And no, I'm not an Amazon affiliate. So like I'm putting the link so you can see the product. You, If you want to look around for other products like this that make sense for you that might be more budget friendly than what I use, that's fine. I also like to have um, six packs. When I do six packs, I like to have them as deep as possible. It's very hard to find ones that are deep. I put a link to the ones I've used most recently, which are six cells per tray. And you buy a whole bunch of them and 120 trays. Like those will last you for a really long time. If you're doing seedlings for the first time, just go to the store and buy some six packs or go to, uh, here's the thing that happens. If you go to the garden section, sometimes they're throwing away these like pots because the plants are dead in it. You can get those pots and use those pots to start plants. If you put out in the network, hey, I'm looking for eight, six, six, you know, like six packs to start seedlings in. It's very likely somebody has them. Or if you guys team up with each other, you can buy one set of 120 and divide them up. Like 120 of those, especially for somebody like me who doesn't destroy them every year. I reuse them. I've had them since 2020. That's the last time I bought pots. And I'm not buying them this year. I have plenty. In fact, if you come to my house, I probably could give you eight of those for your own seed starting pleasure, right? But I like them to be deeper. So the standard ones are usually like two inches tall. If you're lucky, they might be one inch tall. Those are not awesome. If you get the shorter ones, you're going to have to transplant your seedlings sooner than, uh, than if you get the taller ones. I love three to four inch tall ones. To get the four inch tall ones, you have to actually order those through a greenhouse supply company. I haven't actually found any anywhere else. But those are my favoriteest in the whole world. So just depending on what you can get your hands on, get those, those pots and then put them in the water 
sort of like the water, the redneck water uh, table method that I use. Now, if you don't want to start directly in six packs, another thing you can do is take one of those trays, those big trays with the holes in them so that water does fall through, fill it with soil, and then do lines of seeds and label them. Otherwise, you won't know what they are. <laughs> something ADHD Nicole would totally do. Um, and keep it watered from underneath or top water it until they germinate and then very carefully move the plants with just their first like emergent leaves into the pots, the six packs where they're going to be. I did that for many years where I would start, you know, 20 plants per row and then decide how many of those I, I put in the pots that worked great. And it was, it enabled me to germinate things. Uh, so it's like the, there's a germination phase and then move them over to the lighted area for the grow out phase. That was it. Um, so you can do that method. Uh, that is, if you're doing a lot of bulk, that works really well. If you just want 36 plants, I would just put a few seeds per cell of a six pack because You'll probably get a couple of plants if you do that and choose whichever one's the strongest. But if one of your seeds doesn't germinate, you want to have two, you know, two to three seeds. So at least one of them germinates in there. Um, another thing you can do is use red solo cups. Those work. They're cheap. They take up more space. And then uh, the peat pots are not my favorite. If you do not keep those peat pots wet, like the peat part wet, it can really damage the roots and that's a pain in the neck. Um, some people like using and swear by the peat pots. I think they suck. I think they take a lot more work than you need to have. So yeah. Uh, Beth Emily says she's used her heat pad in the last couple of years as a seedling mat. So that's another thing you could just have like two is one, one is none. And then the fourth thing is your soil. Your first year doing seedlings you should buy your soil. As much as I would love for you to do a, a complex composting method and get everything balanced perfectly in your soil and start your seeds with your own soil, it works a lot better the first time to cut out variables and letting the perfect be the enemy of the good is not awesome. So buying potting mix, especially seedling potting mix, can work really well. And there are, um, so I know you can order online some really awesome, super, super de duper de organic soils to be shipped to your house, or you can go to the store and buy one and try it. And a hack I do for that is I will take some of my, if I use potting soil from the store, I take some of my garden soil that already has like the local fungi in it and I mix it just 10% with the garden, with the potting soil so that I get some of the local fungi into the potting mix I'm using. That's like next level. Like just starting with the pot potting mix, it has tons of fertilizer in it, whatever, use it. It'll get it done. Buy a good one from the store and you will have a lot fewer problems. As you develop your gardening skills, though, it is a great idea to make your own soil for seed starting. So sort of your advanced skill to develop is when you know your soil is like the right consistency, it's going to hold, hold moisture the right way, it's not going to bog down the seeds, it's like really good soil, you might go out and dig up some of that and, and start it, or you might make your own from your compost, your, your own seed, seedling soil. Um one of the things to watch out for in store-bought soil is like the bark dust problem. Like some of them are just all bark dust. That soil sucks. You want to, like, it's worth, you're not going to use that much to start your seedlings. It's worth just investing in a good soil if you can do it. Um, you can even go half and half. Like as you get good with soil, you can go half your soil, half the other soil. Um, I just think that you will have a lot better success your first year if you invest in lights, some sort of heat mat, 
and the right soil. And then it doesn't really matter which seeds you grow, whether you get them free from friends or you, you get some packets at the Dollar Tree or you go for these awesome heirloom, you know, Cherokee purple tomatoes or whatever it is you want to do. So from a, a working backwards standpoint, here's how the process works. Now, now that we've talked about all of the pieces is you get the seeds, you get the soil, you put it in the pots and you seed the pots as deep as it says on the packet you should go. Put it in the redneck water table and then I will top water it a little bit to make sure the soil is completely wet. Especially if you buy soil, it may be really super dry from being in the store too long. If that's the case, I pour it in a five gallon bucket and fill the bucket with water and let it soak for an hour. And then I kind of pull it out and put it into my pots. And then I know that it has appropriately absorbed water because you will end up with what's called hydrophobic soil. If, if your potting soil is totally dried out, hydrophobic means you pour water in it. The water pours out the bottom. You think you've watered that plant. The water's just pouring through. It's not like being retained. That's why you don't, that's another reason you don't want to let your pots dry out. So you put the soil in, put the seeds in, um, set up the water table system, put the seed mat under the tray that's holding the water, turn it on. And then I usually will put like saran wrap over the top to keep humidity nice in there. Uh, or you can buy one of those trays that has the cute little plastic top. If you do that, though, you're going to be uh, lowering your lights like under the top once you get like even touching that top is not low enough for the lights if you don't want leggy plants. So then you're going to keep your eye on it. And when it germinates, you're going to make sure your lights go on on a cycle. You want them on for a certain number of hours and off. Some people go 16, 8. I usually go 18 to 20 hours myself on how long the lights are on and then turn them off. Uh, if it's your first year and you don't want to buy a timer, you need to remember to turn your lights on and off. And that's another, if you accidentally leave them on, you know, it's not the end of the world, but the, you know, like unless you're in Alaska or something, it's not realistic. The plant is exposed to the sun all the time. Right. So you're kind of training your plants for being out in your garden. Um, if you can put a timer on them, you're going to be more successful with that. So I like to, I actually add the extra 15 bucks for a timer that, that can automatically turn the lights on and off. And then once a day, check that water in the little tray. And as long as that water is doing well, you're great. Have the lights right down on those plants. And as they grow, you're just raising that light up with them as they grow. And Usually a few weeks in, you'll notice that they're used, suddenly using a lot more water. When that happens, it's probably time to transplant them. And at that point, I put them in those solo cups. Usually I put them in a bigger pot unless it's unless it's something like the brassica family that I'm going to look just broccoli and cauliflower, which I'm usually just going to put straight out in the garden here because we can maybe put a little row cover and over it. But if it's not pat, you know, if, if it's going to be a frost problem, then I will put the plants into bigger pots until it's more appropriate for them to go outside. And then remember that you need to harden your plants off before they go into the garden. What that means is that you have just grown this in a heated environment that has perfect water. And the real world isn't like that. I'm sorry, plants. And so what you want to do is wait till like three or four in the afternoon one day and put them out for the last two hours of the day in sort of a model. I like to go modeled shade for that. Other people will put them straight in the sun. I'll do that. Um, and then the next day do three hours and then the next day do four hours and then slowly move them into the sun over time. And, you know, a week or two of that, you can move your plants into your garden without shocking them. This is an ask me how I know thing. I sunburned my tomatoes more than one year by just taking them straight from the house and putting them in the garden. Did they live? Did they produce tomatoes? Yes. Do I get more tomatoes from the ones that I ease out into the garden? Yes. I have also tracked that. And it is absolutely true that if I don't sunburn my tomatoes on the way into the garden, they appear to do better at getting me earlier tomatoes. So just a word on hardening off the plants. Some people get it done in a week, but you do want to spend the time doing that. You also want to do that with your seedlings from the store. 
And I know it's like, well, they're outside. Like, why aren't they hard enough? They might actually have gotten totally shocked outside at the store, but it doesn't hurt to harden off your plants for a few days before you just throw them outside to the, to the wolves, basically. And then once it's in your garden, you're on to gardening. So anyway, that's how I talk, how, how I recommend starting your seedlings. And I think it's a really great way to invest your time. It's, it's something the whole family can get involved with, which is kind of nice. And it can save you a lot of money on seedlings over time, especially if you make friends and you both start different kinds of seeds and then you can trade plants. So those are my thoughts. I do have a question here before we sign off. Is sitting it by an open window that's windy good enough for hardening? Oh, wind. Um, something that can make your plants stronger is putting a fan on them because the sideways resistance will make the stems go thicker. So that's just another random thing you can do. Uh, you know, it depends on your window, Justin. I would say I prefer to harden them outside. Uh, what's the temperature outside versus in your window? So it kind of depends on the window, I would say. I mean, that's a good way to start. I still will eventually put them on my back porch, though, I think here. Because none of my window, like my house is just warmer than outside or it's cooler than outside. But it's warmer than outside, even with the window open. So I would definitely just... Put them out on a balcony, on your front porch, or something to get that done. Anyway, if you like the show and want to support the work I'm doing here, you can do it in two ways. One, get your coffee at hollowroast.com. To consider becoming a member. Our member webinar is this Friday, or this Thursday at 2 p.m. We've got one of the best people in marketing and branding that I know. And it's not just that I know. Like, she's legitimately award-winning marketing and branding person that it would be a shame for you to waste your ability to ask her a question. The member webinar, if you want to get your membership benefit, log into your membership portal, grab the coupon poet code that's like right there in that first little note for me, get signed up for that. The link is in the show notes and it's in the email that went out Monday. Get your questions in advance too. I'm providing her with questions for that. Guys, don't miss this opportunity. If you wished you could play, pay somebody who makes thousands of dollars an hour advising people on marketing and branding, you can this Thursday at 2 p.m. Anyway, with that, guys, go out. Make it a great week. <laughs>